Donc, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, euh, C'est avec grand plaisir donc, euh, que je vous introduis euh, Alan Oves de l'Université de Nouvelle-Zélande. Alan va nous entretenir sur les thèmes anciens, l'éducation physique, comme si l'avenir en dépendait. Euh, il est professeur euh, euh, en éducation physique à l'École du curriculum et de la pédagogie à la Faculté d'éducation sociale et du travail à Nouvelle-Zélande, en Nouvelle-Zélande, à, à Auckland. Euh, il a occupé divers postes euh, au sein de la faculté. Il a été directeur adjoint de l'École des études critiques en éducation, chef du groupe d'éducation physique et à la santé et, et chef des programmes au baccalauréat, euh, par intérim au baccalauréat en éducation physique et à la santé. Il a aussi été président de euh, Physical Education New Zealand et est l'actuel président d'un groupe de travail spécialisé dans la AEZ. Alors, la AEZ, c'est l'Association internationale des écoles supérieures d'éducation physique. Donc, il lui constitue un groupe de travail sur la complexité, l'éducation pédagogique et les méthodologies de la recherche pour la auto-formation. Donc, je passe la parole <rire> à Alain qui va faire sa conférence Merci. en anglais. Il va, les questions, on le ferait en français et en anglais. Et avec l'aide de tous, on fait la traduction. Merci. 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 Um, I'd like to start in Māori, because I know that you all speak Māori. Ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki ahu. Tihe i mauri ora, tēnā tāro katoa. E huhi nei, tēnei wā. Bonjour. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the, your First Nations people as the uh, traditional owners and of the land uh, on which we're situated. I bring you greetings from our Māori people, our First Nations people. Also, I'd like to thank the invitation that Cecile has, um, has, has offered today to come and speak to you. And I'd also like to thank you for coming along and being so willing to listen to this crazy person from the other side of the world with a really weird idea about uh, what we should be doing with teaching PE. Um, I'm highly conscious that I don't know your context. I, um, I've sort of come here today with some ideas. I, I'm not here to sort of tell you what you should be doing, but tell you and share some of the ideas that I've had across uh, sort of 25 to 30 odd years of teaching physical education. So let me tell you a little bit about myself first. Who am I? Well, first and foremost, I'm a, uh, a husband and a father. Um, my wife is also a university academic. And I have two wonderful children who are all grown up and uh, out working. They still live with us, but um, that's a different story. I, in my younger days, was a sports person when I was thinner. Um, I played basketball. That was my sport. And uh, I was a teacher. And then I moved into the university and became a, became a teacher educator. When I first moved into the university, what really interested me was working in a degree which turned out physical education teachers, and nobody in the, de in the degree looked at didactics or pedagogy. And so there was this wonderful little space for me to sort of move in. We were doing a lot in the degree on biomechanics and physiology and, and all those sorts of things. So that became my sort of area of specialty. I have been the president of Physical Education New Zealand for a number of years. I'm not anymore, um, but my focus there was on creating a really strong professional community uh, throughout New Zealand. And more recently, I've been working with the ICEP group, as Cecilia said, uh, with the International uh, TGFU group, the Teaching Games for Understanding group, and I'm currently the chair of the International Advisory Board in Teaching Games for Understanding, which is, uh, has been a passion. Uh, like most academics, I'm uh, really you know, keen on writing, and that's what I've got these six months to do. If you want to do some writing, you go around the other side of the world so you can just sit and write quietly, unless somebody finds you and says, oh, come and speak, <laughs> which is why I'm here. So that's a little bit about myself. And as I said, my, my background uh, is as a bit of an activist, uh, as a teacher who's thought critically about 
how can I make a difference in the lives of my students? And so I'm here to, to give you some ideas which might provide a, a slightly different orientation to the way you're going to think. Um, and just give some new lines, some new ideas which we might maybe move forwards, backwards, inside, outwards, just different ways of thinking about and challenging our thinking. So, physical education for what? Why do we do education? Um, we teach in this fantastic subject area. We all love it because most of the kids come out of a classroom and they come down to us and most of them are really looking forward to it and they just love burning off this energy. We, live, we, we sort of teach in this magic, magic curriculum area. Uh, with wonderful potential for doing things with young people. But that's a potential. What's the potential for? Why do we teach that? Is it just about trying to teach our young people to be active, to fit into society, be good workers, and those sorts of things? If you think about it, sport is just a really powerful mechanism for teaching people to follow the rules, don't question the referee, uh, what else? Be fit and healthy, be productive. Okay, so it's a really powerful way of thinking and maybe controlling people. Is that what our purpose is? Our world today is facing a number of massive issues from global warming to you know, the future of, of shortage of energy, of fresh water, of uh, civil wars, terrorism, all sorts of things. And so what's our part as physical educators? What do we do? How can we connect into that? And the important thing about these issues is that they're highly interconnected. They're highly interconnected. So as the world leaders have found, trying to solve one problem is not easy because it's linked to other problems. Solving one can often exacerbate or increase um, other problems. So our issue in education is really to try and challenge ourselves to think what sort of person is going to solve these problems. We can't stick our heads in the sand. These are problems that the world's facing. And as young teachers, our, our issue is how are we going to create some people that might be able to address these problems? And what would that look like? Conventional education is about turning out well-adjusted young people. The issue is, if we're always turning out well-adjusted young people, what do we want them to adjust to? And as people are starting to understand, if our world's not a good world, then it's probably not a good idea to try and get them to adjust to a sick world. And so I want to sort of give you an idea of, or start with a quote from Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, uh, at some 50, 60 years ago, was speaking to um, an education group in the south of uh, the USA. And his response was this, in terms of, of trying to think ahead about, should we be turning out well-adjusted young people? And his response was, we, never, we must never adjust ourselves to racial discrimination or racial segregation. We must, must never adjust ourselves to racial bigotry. We must never adjust ourselves to economic conditions that, fake, uh, that take necessities from the many to give to uh, luxuries to the few. We must never adjust ourselves to the madness of military militarianism and um, the self-defeating effects of physical violence. As he said, what we need to be able to do in the future, perhaps, is not to produce well-adjusted young people, but to produce creatively maladjusted people. I don't know if that translates into French particularly well, but um, maladjusted, it's the exact opposite of often what we're trying to do in physical education. How do we create somebody who's maladjusted, creatively maladjusted? And what would that look like? I think there are two things that are important to being creatively maladjusted. OK? 
Okay. I have to read because I can't read French. What am I saying? <laughs> um, there are two aspects of being this creatively maladjusted person. The first one is to be an authentic person. Now that's a strange statement. What does an authentic person look like? Well, authenticity is often contrasted with being phony, being not real. So that's what I mean. So what does a phony person look like? Authenticity is about having a sense of knowing who you are, being confident in your own beliefs, uh, and not trying to impress through, through the trappings of modern society. Not that, you know, you, we don't need a quest to have the latest phone, the latest clothes, the latest car, the biggest house, and what have you. Authentic people are very self-assured, open-minded um, people. And we want them active. We want people who are active and engaged in the moment, are present, not always on their phones, but they're here, they're active, they're willing to get involved. And so together, these two things bring us to this idea of perhaps what we're looking for is this engaged citizen. So what does it mean to be a citizen in Montreal? What does it mean to be a citizen of Canada, an active and engaged citizen of a local community? The second part here is being able to appreciate and understand interdependence. Interdependence. So we're not independent people. We don't operate independent of everybody else, but we're interdependent. We rely on other people. Our actions influence those around us and their, in, their actions influence us. I read recently that um, somebody set out to make themselves some toast from scratch. Okay. And it took them two years. That involved, and you can think what's involved in making some toast. They have to grow wheat, they have to mill the iron, they have to create some electricity, I mean, right from scratch. So you suddenly start to see, if it takes two years to make some toast, because you've got to mill, uh, mill the, uh, grow the rice, uh, wheat, and mill it and turn it, you know, uh, get butter and all of those sorts of things to make and bake bread. You see how interconnected our lives are? Because we can just pop down to the supermarket and buy. We're highly interconnected people. So the people what we need in the future are people that can see in relation. They see how important relationships are, those attachments, those connections, how important they are. And so um, what we're looking and, and have a, an empathy of care, have a, have a sense of care for those people around them. And so the second part about being creatively maladjusted is this community builders, people who are attached to their community, who have an ethic of care, of looking around and making sure that the people in their community are well looked after. Because if we're worried about health, we want to be able to push further than just looking at individual health. We want to look at our community health, the health of our, the people in our communities, the ecology, okay, is our, is, our, is our world in a healthy state. So we've got to push that notion a little bit broader. So, this is what we're aiming at. How can we create people? who are going to be connected to their environments in a way that they create less of a footprint, less of an impact on the environment. So, the goal, what's our part to play in that? I've got a few little ideas. Okay, so this is some of the things I think are needed um, to be brought into physical education, what should sort of form some of our key goals when we're working with young people. I think what we need is a real strong ethic of care. Okay, looking out for the people in our communities, having a strong sense of what's important and that everybody in the community is looked after, and not just everybody, but the trees, the lakes, 
uh, and uh, you know the physical, natural environment, biological environment. We want to be able to make physical activity a core part of our society. Physical activity, we need to find a way of building that in so it just becomes natural. This is what we do. Um, so the, I, the notion here is to think about how do we advocate for more active transport, more active lives. So my, my personal goal would be to get rid of elevators and escalators and things like that. Um, we could still probably have an elevator, but maybe if you put a dollar in to use it, it might change everybody's perspective on whether they're going to use the elevator or not. But we have to be able to see that physical activity is really important because it lowers our footprint on the planet as well as having really positive benefits socially and emotionally and physically for us. Um, so that means there's another aspect of this. We really do need to um, take the notion of physical activity away from something that you feel like you have to do. Okay? Because I think if you had a choice of coming from home to here by car or by walking, if it was quicker by car and easier by car, you'd naturally take the car. So the challenge for our um, community designers is to say, how do you build an environment where it's a real viable choice for you to either take a bike, walk, or take a car. When I lived in Sweden, the, the city that I was uh, living in, it was easier and faster for us to walk into town than it was to drive the car, just because of the way the pathways were designed. Now, when it's easier and faster to walk, then you start thinking to yourself, do I want to take the car or walk? I'm going to save time and walk. Okay? So that's the challenge. How do we create those situations so that, that w activity is a natural and everyday part of our built environment, our social environment, and what we do? We have to be able to find a way of bringing back play, of being able to enjoy play. I'm, I'm pretty certain that's why you're in a phys ed course and why you like physical education, because play is such a big part of what it means to be human. In our society, somehow, and I know it's, you know, the person to blame is going back to the 17th century, and it's um, Rene Descartes who sort of divided, uh, you know, the world into two. And so nowadays we think of work versus play. And so play is something you do when you're not working. It's, play is frivolous and fun, and work is the important stuff. Play is something that the body does, and work is something that the brain does. And so somehow we have to break down that, that division and say play is an important aspect of everything that we do. Play, when you think about it, helps us to approach issues um, breaks them down, m makes us feel part of, of the situation, L takes the seriousness down a bit. It helps us connect to those people around us. Uh, it sort of livens up the situation. I think the role of physical educators is to create play-enabled people. We have to be able to position play as a form of disability or ability. Now, most of the time, my suspicion, and I'm not blaming you because I have not seen any phys ed teachers in, in Canada, but I think a large part of our profession produces play-disabled people. They play in a way that it's about winning and losing and being highly competitive. Okay? That's our contribution to creating a play-disabled community. We want to be able to play, uh, create play-enabled people people who build it into their natural everyday lives okay, as being, um, so that's an idea there. 
I think it's really important for us as teachers, and especially in the phys ed world, to work on redefining what success means for young people. Success does not mean having the latest cell phone, driving the best car, or seeking to have a really flash house and, and all of those sorts of things. When we're seeking those things, we're, we're trying to attain something else. And generally what we're trying to attain by having flash clothes or um, cell phones and all those material things is probably something else. We want friendships, we want um, company, we want to feel valued, we want to, you know, we need to search underneath. So what are those trappings trying to do? And that's what we should be working with kids. Success is not about having a lot of money. Success is built on other things. <sighs> Lastly, I think physical education is a subject where we can really model what living in a functional democracy is all about. So we live in a, in a country which is based on democratic ideals. And so it's a really valuable opportunity for us to teach our young people what that democracy means. What does it look like? What does it mean to be part of uh, a democratic society, be an engaged citizen in that democratic society? If we don't give our young people the skills and the abilities to participate in democracy, then we can't expect them to graduate from schools and be these active, engaged citizens. So somewhere in the education process, we have to give them those opportunities. The wonderful thing about physical education is that it creates a low-risk situation for us to practice democracy. Okay. In a sense, we can provide, we can create options, we can create democratic situations. If they work, fantastic. If it fails, it's not the end of the world. So kids learn by success and failure and reflecting on those sorts of things. Physical education can do that. We're not as bound as many of the other subject areas. So, so let us think. Okay, so those are wonderful idealistic type of ideas. The thing that I always get when I, when I get really enthusiastic and I'm talking ideologically, this is fantastic, we should, should be doing this, we should be doing this, is that teachers normally say, but how? <laughs> you don't understand my situation. And so we do have to think, okay, we need, need to consider some things. The thing about teaching is that we always arrive in the middle of something. We always arrive as and there's a history behind it. We arrive in a flow of ideas. The school has been there before. Education and teaching has got 150 years of this is the way we do things. So we always arrive in the middle with a history and a sense of where we're heading for it. We arrive in this midstream. Okay, so it's really difficult to begin to change those. All those ideas, we tend to find that we, we're kind of stuck in the current. And across time, those things become really grooved. We kind of get, you know, it's like a river. We, we flow along with those ideas. There's a whole lot of mechanisms that make sure that you flow along in those ideas. Okay, especially if you're a student and you'll be going out on practicum, and even though you'd like to do something different, there'll be all sorts of reasons why you can't. You know? And if you're a teacher, there'll be all sorts of reasons why you can't, because we're stuck in that, the, the, the sort of the groove. And this river becomes our history. This is it. It flows this way. It becomes the norm. This is the way we do things around here. This is what physical education is. This is what education in Canada and Montreal is. It becomes really hard to swim against that current. The thing is, If, now, and um, I imagine you've looked at somebody like John Dewey, um, the, Amer the American pragmatist philosopher of uh, you know, 1905 to 1930s. John Dewey said there, there, are, there are two ways of kind of acting. We can act 
um, out of routine. This is the way things are done. This is, I've always done it this way because it's a routine way of doing things. Um, I remember a story in, um, I think it's somebody I knew, or might have been my family, I'm not sure, that when they were cooking a turkey for you know, Thanksgiving, they always cut their head and the tail off and fold it all up and stuck it in the, the oven. That's the way it had been passed on to them for years. And then to one day, one of the, um, the, the young people said to their grandmother, why do we cut the head and the tail off for? <laughs> why do we do that? And the grandmother said, oh, well, um, because when I was young, the oven wasn't big enough, so we cut it up. But nowadays the oven's bigger, and I don't know why. So every subse you know, subsequent pop, um, generation had just followed the same routine without thinking about it. And we do the same in education a little wee bit. The trouble is when we all think the same, thinking tends to stop. Okay? Diversity is really important. We need people to be thinking differently. And when we people are thinking differently, we're, we're challenged, we're provoked to sort of reflect on our beliefs. So we need to be conscious that the way we do things has become a convention. And if we're not careful, it'll stifle the way we, we think about teaching. We have to become conscious that we're deeply entangled into our everyday lives. If you're a teacher, you become interwoven, in a sense, with your school and the education system. Uh, interwoven in terms of, this is the facility, these are the desks, this is the equipment I've got, here is the curriculum, here is my pay, this is the principal, um, these are my colleagues. All of these things, all these attachments I have are like the ropes that really constrain what is possible. And so, in order to change, that's a challenge. How do we change when we're so attached, we're so interwoven into practice, we're deep in that river, it's hard to swim against that river. The thing is, we can't just cut ourselves free. We can't just cut off those connections and attachments because those attachments are critical to who we are. If we cut those attachments, we just set ourselves adrift. Okay? It's hard. So we have to change and shift perspective on how we see those connections. Becoming emancipated, being that powerful teacher, is not a matter of freeing yourself up from the bonds, of freeing yourself up from those attachments. Connections matter. And that's an important thing I need you to sort of think about. Connections matter. So as professionals, how are you going to become attached? Not detached, how are you going to become attached? So what we want to be able to do is think about those attachments as forces that can create things, not necessarily as things that can limit us. Okay. They will limit, but they also have the power to create. So connections matter. So as professionals, how do we connect? To our, what's our professional network? Who do we connect with? Okay. So as a young teacher, are you, and, or as a student, are you connecting with the people that you need to connect with? Sometimes we need to say our biggest enemy is our best friend because they're not there to help us get through university. Sometimes the best way to succeed at university is change friends. Okay? Connections matter. When you're in a, a group of people who are all focused on studying, who are all um, sharing their ideas and reading what have you, that's powerful. Those are the connections that work for you. When you're a, a young teacher being in a department, being able to connect to a professional uh, group like CAPERD or uh, uh, even a local little group of people that meet and share ideas is powerful. Okay. So what we want to be able to do is to be able to shift, to not necessarily follow what everyone else has done before, but begin to uh, look at the possibilities if we start authoring our own little pathways. That's the goal.
just see how I'm going for time here. All right, that's good. <laughs> Lots of time left. All right, so how do we author our own pathways? That's probably the key, you know, the most important point here. We know that we're highly con you know, constrained. We know that connections matter. And so um, the next thing then is um, to think about doing um, research. Now, I know inquiry, the word inquiry doesn't translate well into French. Uh, the, the, the idea I'm trying to capture here is, is the notion of teachers doing research on their practice. But research is a scary thing. And it's, it's got a name that's, you know, woof, you know, teachers don't do research. We, we tend to think of, you know, the, the theory and the practice and teachers are the ones who are deep into practice and the realities of teaching and the academics are those who deal in theory and, and um, sit somewhere else. We want to bring those things together. So it's about creating a research culture, a professional culture, in which teachers are actively involved in researching and um, thinking about their practice. And as Tony Clark from um, uh, University of British Columbia says, um, that research is a defining feature of what professionals do. Being somebody who's constantly thinking about their practice is a defining feature of professional practice. If you stop doing that, then your practice ceases to become professional. Okay, so step one for us to create change, to shift our attitude and our mindset to say, as professional teachers, that research, doing research in our practice becomes critical. Okay? That's what it means to be a professional teacher. So it's a bit of an ideological battle. It's certainly easy not to do research, not to challenge and question our teaching to just follow and be part of the river and just flow the way everybody else does. It takes, it's a little bit harder to be that teacher that's questioning and thinking and gathering information out of their lessons and making decisions. But it's important. Can you imagine going to a doctor and you walk in and you've got a headache and you walk into the doctor and the doctor looks at you and says, here's a bandage, put that on your knee, come back next week, you'll be fine. And you think, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you didn't even find out what was wrong. Said, no, don't worry, off you go, you'll be fine. And pay as you go out. Okay? Mm -hmm. Doctors, like most professionals, gather information. How often, as a teacher, do we start with that diagnostic? Students come into our classrooms, we like that doctor. Hello, everyone, here's the bandage, put it in. Hello, everyone, we're going to do... Uh, hockey today, we're going to play football today, we're going to do this today, without sort of doing those diagnostic things. So we have to change that mindset to being what do professionals do, how do professionals operate. So some of the ideas. Now what I have been um, working with, with Tim Fletcher from Brock University, is this notion of the self-study of practice. And self-study of practice is that ability to research the most interesting person in the world, which is yourself. Okay? Uh, when you put yourself as the center of the research and you're studying yourself, it's sort of self-generating. It's really interesting. But it's, it's guided, self-study of practice is guided by a few things. Firstly, and I put this up front, it's led by a desire to get better a desire to improve. The inter interesting thing is not everybody's driven by that desire, and that's fine. If you don't want to get better, then don't do self-study. Um, but it's important. You have to be really confident as a person and as a teacher, going back to that authenticity idea, you have to be confident to be able to put your, te your teaching on the table and pull it apart. It's uncomfortable. Self-study is then, the next step is that it's self-initiated. It's driven by the questions that the teachers want to know. Okay, now when we've done this with teachers and you ask them, what's the most important thing? What's a key issue for you? Every teacher tends to have a different key issue. B 
because schools are so different and students are so different. So you want to be able to build a study around what's the important thing for the teacher. You don't want someone else coming in like that doctor who just says, look, here's the, here's the uh, solution. So it has to be built around the teacher initiating the research and being in charge of the research. And then the research is interactive. Every step of the way it's interactive. It's interacting with um, the evidence that you're collecting out of your class, with your colleagues, friends, with the readings, going to the research literature. Okay, it's interacting, so you're making sense. And um, you're trying to get the evidence to tell the story. You kind of like, you get CSI here in Canada, the TV program, so you kind of like the CSI investigator of your own practice. You know, what is the evidence telling me about my practice? Okay, so the evidence, let the evidence tell a story about whether um, these, these students are learning and how they learn and what they need to learn. And through all of that, the last step in self-study, which is the essential thing, is how do we reframe our understanding? How do we shift our understanding of what we do? So that's the process of, of doing some self-study. It's a little bit open-ended. So now I'll, what I'll do is I'll give you a little bit more of a, a kind of framework around what a professional, uh, maybe a department wa might want to set up. Okay, so as you probably looked at in your didactics class, um, this is a fascinating relationship, teaching and learning. So how are we going to study this? I've put them as two different squares because these two ideas slide across each other. Okay? There's no direct connection between them. As my, my students say, you can stand up there and teach, doesn't mean we're learning. Okay? No? I, you're, you probably never have that with your professors, but my students say, look, teaching can happen and no learning takes place. And the other, other thing that can happen is a lot of learning can take place and no teaching's being done. Okay? So there's no direct relationship between those two concepts. They slide over each other. And that's what makes teaching such a fascinating thing, to try and master two slippery concepts and how do we build up something that's meaningful between them. So our research, and if I was in a department, I'd be setting up three different types of research. Or these, these are three different ways that we can start to investigate our practice. The first one is a focusing style of research. We were asking a question is, what is important for my students to learn? Okay. So what is it that my students need to learn? Now in New Zealand when we've done this, we've found that there is a big difference between what the school teaching or what the school is doing and what the kids are doing in their own time. We tend to focus on sport, students tend to be doing very different physical activities in their leisure time. In New Zealand it tends to be rugby is number one, and yet rugby might not even be in the top ten of what students are doing in their leisure time. Okay, so there is a, there is a need for us maybe once or twice a year to gather information about what is it that my students need to know. So we need to be able to do some sort of scanning. Okay. Surveys. How often do we go out and ask parents, what, are, what should they be learning in the physical education program? Where should our priorities be? We're going to be looking at what sort of knowledge is redundant, what we don't need to learn anymore, uh, and what is new. Parkour, um, you know, sort of fascinating new activities coming in. Can I make use of that, tap into that? Can I get rid of something like um, ice hockey? <laughs> No. You've got to give New Zealand a chance every so often, you know. <laughs> All right. So from a focusing inquiry or focusing research, we go to teaching research. In a teaching research, we're looking at what are those, the didactics, what are the, what are the, the teaching approaches and strategies that might work? Okay. Now, if you're like me, and when I was teaching, I had some favorite activities. Okay. Kids... I used to think the kids really love doing this. The hardest question to ask is, do they really like doing this? And does it achieve what I want it to achieve? 
there might be a better activity out there. So teaching um, research focus is about what sort of strategies are going to help my students learn the content that I want them to learn. When you start doing that, it's quite fascinating to see what I kind of hang on to at times, my favorite activities, and I realize that they're not actually achieving what I want them to do. So I start to shift. So I start to think about my rationale of what I'm trying to do, and then I start looking at my planning. How am I going to plan ahead uh, to bring in some new ideas? The third um, way of doing research is to look at the effect of the learning. What is it that students are learning? Okay. So I might be teaching, but I also have to have a sense of what's working. Okay. We know that students, like yourself, can be really well behaved, they can be quiet, and learning nothing. So as a teacher, I can often get the right, wrong idea. Um, I can, in a physical education class, have kids who love phys ed, about maybe half of them really being active, and the other half who hate it just kind of being in the background. And I don't notice those things. So unless I'm actually inquiring into my class, what is it that students are learning, um, then I'll miss all that. So now I've kind of set up a bit of a professional structure that a department in a school might be able to set up for themselves. I might be doing a focusing, as a department, we might do a focusing research maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, sending some questionnaires home, having a, a day when we meet and talk about the curriculum, what are the new activities. We might gather a survey from the students, look at that. I might be um, three or four times a year, uh, or more regularly, connecting, going to courses, finding out some new ideas, and then um, thinking about how does that, how am I going to try that out in my, um, uh, in my teaching. So at the moment, I know in New Zealand, it might be the same here, that a lot of teachers are really interested in digital and mobile technologies and how they're going to build that into their class. So there's a lot of work going on in that. And then finally, um, I think this is something that has to happen really regularly, that the students, you, you're, as a teacher, you are um, constantly finding out what is it that students are learning from my class. If you've read any of John Hattie's work, Professor John Hattie, um, who seems to be probably in the South Pacific and New Zealand and Australia, he's got a big name. Um, he's done some, quite a lot of research and he would say the most effective thing that you can do as a teacher, the, the thing that makes a difference, the biggest difference in kids learning is their feedback to you as a teacher. You knowing what's working and what's not working. When you know the types of things where the kids are learning this, what, what areas they're having trouble in, then you can respond to that. Okay, so. Um, I just want to finish off with four ideas and come around to, because you can be inquiring. You can be that teacher who's, who's asking questions and gathering information. And you can do that, you can have that as a departmental goal. But unless you've got your values, unless you're trying to create something um, different, then you're going to be maybe not creating change. Now, as I said, I'm a bit of an, I think I'm a bit of an activist teacher. I work strongly for um, social justice in my classes. I try a lot of ideas around that. And so, um, these are the, working with one of my colleagues, these are some of the ideas that we've come up with, what we're calling the principles. So these are the kind of principles that drive our teaching when we want to be transformative teachers. The first one is that learning has to be embodied. Now as physical education people, we know that. Learning is not just a cognitive thing. We don't just gather information through our eyes and ears. Okay? We feel. Okay? Emotion is a really powerful driver of learning. And so if you want people to learn, you have to draw the whole body in. It has to be a whole body experience. And so where possible, we want students to feel that learning, 
feel empowered, feel as though they have a voice, feel what it's like to be disadvantaged, feel what it's like to be listened to. Okay. And so we need to shift what we do from just seeing moving as something that's functional, keeps us healthy, to seeing moving as a critical aspect of how people learn and engage in the world. One, so when we want to teach something, our primary objective is how do we, how do we make that a physical experience for young people? The second idea is to be able to spot and value diversity. So, an old idea used to be that we had a normal group and we had others. And we were trying to teach everyone to be like that fit in, to be normal. And that you might be deaf and so you're an other. Okay. But as we look at young people, and you've probably done this in your own classes, I'm probably not telling you absolutely anything new, but once we're into classes, the fascinating thing is, is that diversity is normal. Everybody is different. Everybody is different from somebody else. There is no ideal student, ideal body, ideal person. Everybody is different from everybody else. So we have to see diversity as normal, and then we have to see that as a strength. How can we build diversity into our classes? Because when we have diversity, as I said before, when everyone's the same, thinking stops. We want to be able to have diverse viewpoints, diverse opinions, to be able to provoke ideas, stimulate new ways of thinking. Hmm. I forgot what that says. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say? Implay. Uh, oh, I see. I know, I know, I know. Sorry. Yes. Co-contributors to course design. Okay. So, if we want to model what a functional democracy looks like, can we bring young people into the course design process? Are they, can they have a space in designing what physical education program in a school looks like? So my students, for instance, if you were in my class at the university, you would be involved in designing the course. Okay. So when I get back from here, because we'll start, our, our year begins March, I will start with the students who are enrolling in my course in March, we'll start designing the course for next year. Okay. And so I think that's important because they're the beneficiaries of the course. They'll get the benefit of the course, so they should have some voice in what that course is going to be about. Um, and so in the same way, I think students should have the ability to contribute to course design. Now that's contribute, not completely design it. They contribute to it. They can work alongside it by gathering, by giving students that voice, by gathering their opinions, thoughts, and what have you. It becomes very powerful. Now, that in um, one way positions students differently students no longer become the object of our teaching, but they become a subject of teaching. So they're no longer just what we operate on, but we're working together. Um, if you look at the history of education, classes kind of came about um, because groups of people would come together and say, look, we can hire a tutor and uh, it was always driven by the students. We'll pay because we can get 30 people together, all combine our money because only the rich people could used to be able to afford education. So if a group of people came together and they all put in a little bit of money, we could hire a tutor. So the power always rested with the students. Okay, so they were the ones who were sort of controlling that. Somehow we've turned it around to say these, the, our young people, the student is an object of our teaching practices. So I'm trying to re we pull that back a little wee bit. Um, and, um, and there are four aspects to that, which I'll let you read. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could read that. 
All right. I think it's really um, oh, self-explanatory. All right. <laughs> I wish I could read that, too. All right. All right. This links to the self-study idea. We need to be able to question our practice. We need to move away from the routine. This is how it's always done. This is how we have to keep on doing it. And to start questioning, why is it done this way? And I understand that it takes a lot of bravery to ask why. I'm always asking my students when they go on practicum, sit down with your associate teachers and the cooperating teachers and ask, why do you do it like this? But most of them say, oh, we can't do that. <laughs> I say, why can't you do that? I'm not saying that the teacher's wrong, but as professionals, we should be able to justify why are we doing this? And to get into a professional discussion. So we have to get into that disposition, that way of operating, that we're very happy to question and challenge our teaching and be able to explain why we do things. Uh, and lastly, um, I think, and this is more the traditional notion of social justice, it should be about lifting um, our consciousness, about understanding the mechanisms through which uh, oppression, uh, disadvantage uh, are taking place, and be prepared to take some action. Now, my criticism of most of the research in physical education around the world on this is that we spend most of our time focused on inside the classroom. We have some research going on about what are the best ways to teach for social justice. Now, that's kind of important, but I think it's misplaced. The best place you can put your energy is into the school structures. So making sure that the school structures are organized in a way that they're promoting fairness so that everybody get a, gets a chance to do physical education, that girls' interests and aspects are part of the uh, curriculum, that our indigenous and First Nations people have also got an aspect in their curriculum and being, um, we're responding to them. Those are more important than the actual individual practices and didactics that we're using in the classroom. You anyway, know, so those are the five principles. So I want to come back down to the starting question, which was physical education for what? And I want to finish with uh, a quote, 10 years on, uh, Martin Luther King, shortly before he was um, shot. Um, and this time he was responding to the Vietnam War. Okay? But I think reading this speech, that it's, it's very cogent, very uh, relevant to today. So I've broken it down a wee bit. He says, now let us begin. Now let us re-educate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle um, for a new world. Okay? That's relevant. As teachers, surely that's what we're, we're involved in. As physical education teachers, we're involved in creating a better new world that our young people can occupy. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell ourselves the struggle is too hard? Okay. Once again, you often hear, you know, hey, I'm just a teacher in a school. It's really, really difficult to change. Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with our own yearnings of commitment to the cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours. And though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose this crucial moment in human history. So that's what he said in 1967. So I think it's still relevant today, which is why I would end with that notion of how incredibly important it is for us to teach physical education as though the future depends on it. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā no tātou katoa. Thank you. Miasi. <laughs> or they 
more easily applied to uh, physical education? Uh, I think they're a topic a school needs to address. Um, there are priorities that a school's trying to do in terms of education. There are definitely some of those things should be dealt with in science and English and maths. But we have a subject area which is uh, easily adaptable. It's, it's, the, it's such a powerful area. We can easily shift to these sorts of ideas. So I think it's more important for us because it's harder to convince an English teacher or a science teacher that this is important. Uh, yes, I, there is in my mind. Uh, the, the reason I wanted to start looking at the notion of how interconnected we are is that I think reflection has two major problems. One is that just reflecting by ourselves as an individual, we have very little agency to make any change. Once again, most of our research in education and in physical education is trying to educate the the, uh, the teacher to do a better job. Um, and in fact, my postgraduate students, we have a name for it, which is um, my postgraduate students normally start with solutionitis. Okay? Everyone starts their, post, uh, their postgraduate with, I know what the answer is. If the teachers would just do a better job, I will go and teach them to do a better job and they'll be fantastic. The thing is, nearly every teacher is trying to do their best, and they'll just say. So I don't think reflection by itself is the, um, the answer. What I've tried to shift there in that notion are several ideas. One, we need a collective agency. Okay, so reflection or inquiry or research has to be a collective thing, a departmental thing. It needs support through the whole school. Um, and it's about also shifting the disposition. So this is what professionals do, both individually and as a department. Okay, so then, so reflection's okay, but we're actually shifting up a little wee bit. I kind of more like the idea of refraction than reflection. Refraction is that ability to um, go through a, a prism and, and have everything split up, or is that diffraction? Not exactly certain. Um, but we need a theory or well, we need something like trans principles of transformative practice to be able to understand our practice. Okay. Uh, as my, some of my students sort of, uh, they reflect and they'll say things like competition. Kids really like competition and that's the level of their reflection and they'll come back after practicum saying, solved it, just gave them lots of relays and lots of competitions and is that really what we want? So. All oh, right, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Spoke too long. <laughs> All right. So you have to finish. Okay, lovely. Thank Merci you. Merci pour tous, pour votre présentation. Thank you. Merci.